Well, welcome to Scripture and Science. My name is Will Barlow, and I'll be your teacher for this class. I'm incredibly thankful to Pastor Sean Finnegan and the other leaders of Living Hope International Ministries for the opportunity to teach this class. Before we get too far, I'm sure you have some questions. Like, who's this Will Barlow guy? And what is he doing teaching this class on Scripture and Science? So here's a little bit about me and why I wanted to teach this particular class. I've been interested in uh, the dialogue between faith and science since I was a little kid. I actually remember uh, sometime around age 10 or 12 asking my dad how to reconcile certain things I was hearing at school with the Bible and trying to understand how those two can relate. I've always been interested in math, um, always um, interested, I, once I got to high school, was interested in physics. And ultimately that led me to get a degree in physics and mathematics as an undergrad degree. And then later I went on to get a master's degree in secondary education with a focus on STEM education, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So I've been trained in physics, I've been trained in mathematics, I've also been trained in how to educate and communicate uh, science and mathematics to others. And so I'm really excited about this class. I'm really excited about the opportunity that I have to, to educate and to talk about some of these issues related to the scripture and science. My research in this field led me to publish a book which I call God and Science. I published that in late 2016. And uh, a new thing that's come up in the last year or so and, and will be coming up in the next six months is um, some friends and I are starting a new church called Compass Christian Church here in Louisville, Kentucky, and I will be serving as the head pastor. So I'm very excited about that. Before we get too far into the goals for the class, I want to give two big caveats. In this class, we'll be talking about scripture and science, and I think one of the main goals for that will be evangelism, reaching out to others and helping them understand that you can relate scripture and science together. But when we think about reaching out uh, to others and evangelizing, especially to those who are outside of the faith, the two most powerful weapons in your arsenal are the gospel message of kingdom and cross and the personal testimony of what God's done for you. Those are the two most important things. I don't want to bury those two things here at the beginning of the class. Those two things will always be the two most important things when we're reaching out to others. So in this class, I hope to give some additional tools to help you think through the issues related to the Bible and science, and maybe we can help others along the way as well with those issues. The second caveat before we get to the main part of the class is I don't have all the answers. I haven't read every book on the subject. Uh, I studied physics as an undergrad. I haven't been in that material professionally for 14 years now. Um, I never studied biochemistry professionally. I never studied geology professionally. So I'm not an expert. I don't have all the answers. So as we go through this class, if there are things that I say that you're like, huh, I'm not sure that's actually the best answer for that, or maybe there's a, a better explanation, I'd love for you to reach out and contact me. I'd, I'd be happy to learn from you, hear from your perspective as well. So with those two major caveats out of the way, here are my goals for the class. The first thing is I would love for us to learn about various ways to read Genesis 1. Many of us come into this class with maybe one way or maybe a couple ways that we're comfortable reading Genesis 1. I'm going to present eight different ways of reading Genesis 1 in this class. So we're going to learn about other ways to read Genesis 1, hopefully, than what you've heard before. And so the goal is not for me to... Uh, refute your view or to trash your view or anything like that. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to educate. Here are all, a lot of our options. I won't even say all of our options, but here are eight major options that we have, and here are pros and cons for them. And as we go through the class, what we're going to do is we're going to do the second thing here. We're going to learn about current views, uh, some current views in physics and astronomy, biochemistry, and geology. And what we're going to do constantly throughout the class is relate what the current science is with the various options we have with Genesis 1. And we're going to do that in an educational way. And again, not trying to 
uh, tip the scales too far one way or the other, but there are pros and cons to each reading that we can take for Genesis 1. At, toward the end of the class, what we're going to do is we're going to think more about miracles, how we define a miracle. Um, a lot of people think that a miracle is um, something uh, where God suspends the laws of physics. We're going to see that in many cases, God uses physics. God uses science to perform certain miracles. And he may suspend his laws at certain times. We'll get into that as well. Two more goals for us, just high level. We're going to be thinking about multiple ways to reconcile the Bible and science. Again, we all come with our background. Some of us have thought about this a lot. Some of us haven't thought about it as much. Um, and so, uh, but, but all of us have ways that we use to reconcile the Bible and science to, to some degree or another. And so we're going to think about many ways of doing that in this class. And then the last thing is be prepared to tell those outside the faith that multiple options exist. So again, if you have a set view on Genesis 1, if you're like, I know I believe in X, this is the way to read Genesis 1. I'm not here to challenge it. I want to help you learn about all these other options so that you know that they exist. I want to help spark thinking about the many ways that we can reconcile scripture and science. So I guess the next logical question would be, well, why even present multiple options? What's the wisdom in presenting multiple options? Well, I think one reason that I think about multiple options being important is found in this verse in 1 Peter 3.15. And for the duration of this class, I'll be using the ESV, but you're free to follow along in whatever version you like. But 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And of course, what this verse has mainly in view is what we've already talked about. The gospel message of kingdom and cross and your personal testimony. Those are the two things at the forefront as we approach a verse like this. When we think about reconciling scripture and science, especially reaching out to those who are outside the faith currently, the way that I think about this and why multiple options is helpful in a scenario like this is thinking about this last part of the verse where it says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. One practical way that we can enter in and make a defense of our faith with gentleness and with respect is to present multiple options to people to say, hey, there are multiple ways of reading Genesis 1. I can, I can give a couple of examples here in a little bit. So, so that's, that's basically the idea here is we want to be able to present our, our uh, gospel message. We want to present our personal testimony. And yes, we want to be able to present to those outside the church who have issues or have, uh, they think they have issues with what the Bible says about science. We can do that with gentleness and respect. Many of us feel like we want to have one solid answer. And I totally get that. That's a totally natural way to think. We want to have the right answer. We want to know the truth. And I think that there is probably a right answer out there. There probably is the truth. There is the one way to read Genesis 1. I just don't have 100% certainty that my way is the right way. I don't have 100% certainty that your way is the right way. And so I think in the meantime, it's helpful to have multiple options on the table. And there are other areas of life and areas of the Bible where there are a lot of different interpretive options and there may not be a way to determine with 100% certainty this is the exact way to go. And in these areas, I think it's really wise to give people a lot of space to consider alternatives. Uh, this reminds me of the Churches of Christ motto, which says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. So that's how we're going to proceed with this class. When we talk about relating scripture and science, I don't believe that there is a um, bottom line, hard and fast rule that we have to use to interpret the Bible exactly this way 
or else we're going to miss the gospel message. I don't think that's true with Genesis 1 or with uh, looking at the flood or looking at all these things that we're going to look at with relating scripture and science. There's a lot of options for a reason because there is no doctrinal requirement or no salvific requirement for believing a specific way about Genesis 1. And so when we're in a situation like that and when there are a lot of um, reasonable options, it's good to have multiple options. And just one quick caveat for that. For those of you who are already thinking, Will, you're going to go through eight different ways of reading Genesis 1. I've got my one, and it's hard for me to remember that one anyway. <laughs> I'm not asking you to memorize all eight options. I don't necessarily think that that's the best way to do it either. I want you to be able to say to someone, hey, I, this is the way I do this. This is the way I reconcile science and scripture. But there are other ways. I've heard of other ways that I can get you resources. And throughout this class, I'll be talking about some of the thinkers and the writers who present different uh, views. And th that'll be a helpful way for you to be like, okay, I don't know how to do, how to explain it this particular way of reading Genesis 1, but I know who can. There's a book out there. I've heard of it. I can go get that resource. So you don't have to remember all of this. You can just be able to hand off resources. Or you can just phone a friend. Maybe you'll, you have a friend that you know that, that knows a ton about scripture and science. I'm happy to be that friend for you if you don't already have one. But there are others. There are plenty of people who love thinking about scripture and science. So if you have that friend, you can also refer people to that friend as well. So here are a couple of scenarios that I was thinking about, when are multiple options better than one? So here's scenario one. We have a current agnostic. That's someone who doesn't know if God exists or not. They're unsure whether God exists or not. And they think that all Christians are young earth creationists, okay? This person believes in evolution. They have um, a real heavy requirement that whatever, whatever move they're gonna make, if they're gonna make a move in the direction of Christianity, they're going to bring that evolution with them. At least initially, they're going to bring that evolution with them. Now, if all you know is young earth creationism and you don't know that some Christians believe in evolution, how can you overcome that objection? And what I'm asking you to do here is not sacrifice what you believe. I'm not asking you to do that. If you still believe in young earth creationism, if you outright reject evolution, good for you. That's, that's your business. That's not my business. But I think it would be a shame for you to come across an agnostic person like this and for you not to be able to just say at least, look, I don't believe in evolution. You're right. I don't believe in evolution. But I know Christians that do believe in evolution. And I do know that there are those resources out there that can help you if you'd like to think about what does a Christian look like who believes in evolution. I can help connect you with people who can tell you more about that. And now we've removed the barrier from believing in Christ. And that's what we want to do. Now, this person, this person may never want to come to Christ. They may just use this as a, as a straw man objection to Christianity. They may never want to consider Christianity. But this will allow you to have your conscience clear that you've removed that barrier to Christianity for them. And I think that's a, a powerful thing that we can do. Here's another scenario for us. We've got a former Christian who grew up in a church they don't remember much about how to reconcile science and faith. Okay, they walked away a long time ago. Maybe their church had a way of reconciling science and faith, but they've, they've mo forgotten most of the details. Uh, this person has a vague feeling about how seriously we should take the text and is suspicious of non-literal interpretation. Okay, we're going to talk about a couple of non-literal interpretations in this class. So if you take a non-literal view of Genesis 1, and you don't know about other options, how can you effectively help this person? So again, we have someone who's walked away from the faith and we wanna bring them into a closer relationship with Christ. And again, what's the barrier here? The barrier here is our opinion about Genesis 1. We don't want our opinion of anything in the Bible to be a barrier for someone. Now maybe we have the truth, maybe we have the right answer, but people need time and they need space and they need love and they need an environment where they can actually make decisions. And so one of the reasons that we're going to go through multiple options in this class is so that we can provide that time and space and that environment for people to consider multiple options um, in this realm. Okay, 
I think that's enough about why multiple options are better than one. But I wanted to start with that because I know it can be uncomfortable for us to consider eight different ways of reading a particular text. So with that in mind, let's get to the main, the main point of this session, which is what is a belief system? What is a belief system? Well, according to Collins's dictionary, a belief system is the set of beliefs that people have about what is right and wrong and what is true and false. So we all have a set of beliefs. We all have a way of viewing the world about what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false. So we all come to the table with a belief system. We also come to the table with a worldview. According to the Oxford Dictionary, a worldview is a particular philosophy of life or conception of the world. We can also, in some sense, call this our bias. And I'll be talking about my bias a little bit throughout this class, because I do, I have a bias. I come from a specific perspective. We all do. And it's important that we acknowledge that as we approach the Bible and as we approach the subject of science as well. I want you to take a moment. I'll give you maybe 30 seconds or so. Take a moment to consider your background your belief system, your worldview, what assumptions do you make about the world around you, especially as it relates to our subject, scripture and science? Those of you at home watching this recording can do the same. Take a little bit of time, think about it. All right. I want to talk about some popular belief systems that we see in the world today. This first one is scientific atheism. It's a very common one. Um, it's growing over time. It's, it's been especially growing over the last uh, 50, 60 years. Scientific atheism is the idea that science can explain everything. There's no need for God to exist. So rational humans can just determine that God does not need to exist. Now, the way that this works from a belief system perspective is, how do you explain the universe exists? Oh, Big Bang Theory. How do you explain life exists? Abiogenesis. How do you explain human life existing? Theory of evolution. They have these answers, or so-called scientific answers, that allow them to go from the beginning point of the universe all the way to us existing today, and they don't see the need for God to exist anywhere along those lines. Now, we're going to evaluate that claim very specifically in this class, and I don't think it's going to stand up at all. But there are people out there that think it does stand up, and so we need to be aware of that. That's a popular belief system. Another popular belief system is called NOMA, or the idea of non-overlapping magisteria. This is an idea that was popularized by Stephen Jay Gould. And basically the idea behind NOMA is religion belongs in one box and science belongs in another box. So you have these two boxes. You've got religion on one hand, it fits in its nice little box. You got science over here and it fits in its nice little box. Maybe I should have switched that because the Bible's over here. You got religion over here in this box, okay. <laughs> You got science over here in this box, all right? So, and those boxes don't touch. They never touch, they never overlap. Now, you'd have to think that, you know, Stephen Jay Gould came up with this, okay, he's, he's a man. I don't know if a woman would have come up with this theory. Women don't typically have boxes that don't overlap at all. Women have boxes that intermingle and connect and all sorts of things, which is wonderful. Men and women are a little bit different that way and that's fantastic. So anyway, does non-overlapping mag magisteria work? I don't think so. I don't think it works. And the reason why I don't think it works is not uh, because I, I have a problem with different boxes necessarily. I think there are some things in life that don't overlap, okay? But I think the Bible does make claims about science that can be either verifiable or non-verifiable. And so I don't think at the end of the day that we can just put religion in a box over here and put science in a box over here and let them play nice and not let them overlap at all. I think there is overlap, and we're gonna talk about that in this class quite a bit. Another popular belief system that's been even more popular in recent times is theism 
which is belief in God, theism mixed with distrust of science. Um, look, science has gone through a cu couple of rough years with the COVID crisis. And here's the thing about science, especially science like microbiology. Uh, the scientific perspective can change rapidly, especially when we're dealing with something that's new. Um, and I'm not trying to make a political statement here at all. I recently read an article about the viability of masks and social distancing. And it talked about how some of the assumptions that our, our scientists have used throughout this process to, to combat COVID were from a paper that was 70 years old about the specific assumption of particle sizes and how far certain particle sizes can travel in an air conditioned environment. So this article urged the scientific community to challenge long held assumptions about particle size and how particles can travel in an air conditioned environment. And I'm sure in 20 years, someone will make a definitive COVID book. Okay. And they'll show all the mistakes we made all the way through scientifically. Okay. And so the science has been changing rapidly. It's led to a public distrust in science. But here's my follow up question to that. How many of you have a cell phone? How many of you have a microwave? How many of you have a TV? I've got a TV. It's right here. How many of you have a computer? Okay. How many of you have a GPS? So we can't fully distrust science if we're using all these modern conveniences that rely on science. And to give a very specific example from the list I just gave, GPSs use Einstein's theory of general relativity to work. Without Einstein's theory of general relativity, GPSs would not work perfectly. So we have to have a certain level of trust in science. We see it working in our lives day by day. That doesn't mean we have to ex be able to explain how electricity works. Some of us can. Uh, we don't have to be able to explain how the weather works. Some of us can. Uh, we don't have, you know, all these different things. Microbiology, I can't explain microbiology. Someone can do a better job than I can. But we can't, I don't think we can fully distrust science. I don't think that's viable. The last one I want to talk about for the purposes of this class is what's called the God of the gaps. This is a common theistic line of reasoning that goes something like this. There's no current explanation for the origin of life. There's no really good current explanation for the origin of life. Since there is no definitive scientific explanation, then God must exist. God must have started life. Well, that's a faulty line of reasoning. Just because we don't have a good current scientific explanation doesn't mean that there won't be a good scientific explanation in 50 years or 100 years. We'll find evidence of something. Now, there may be a scientific reason that we won't find evidence for something. We'll talk about that, too, because there are claims that are made right now by atheists that are not verifiable. That's in essence, it's their religious belief. So we'll talk about that. But we can't make the mistake on our side of the coin by saying just because there's no good scientific explanation for something right now, then God must exist because of that. In this class, we'll be talking a lot about what's the most plausible explanation. There's not a lot of direct scientific evidence that God exists. We can't put God in a lab and weigh him with a microscope or anything, you know, weigh him with a, with a, uh, a weight or find him on a microscope or anything like that. We're not going to be able to, to do an, an experiment that says, oh, look, God exists. What we can do is we can look at the evidence and say, what's the most plausible explanation? Is the most plausible explanation that we're here by accident? Or is the most plausible explanation that God exists and that he created this universe that we live in? So what if there is a better way? And from my perspective, that better way is truth seeking. And from my perspective, truth seeking is a never ending process. And to be a truth seeker, by definition, we must be able to constantly challenge our beliefs, which means we're going to be also challenging our biases or our filters, which is our belief system, our worldview. So how do we decide what the best worldview is? How do we decide what the best belief system is? My suggestion for the duration of this class is that we pick the worldview that explains the most evidence. Whatever worldview explains the most evidence that gives us the most explanatory power, that's going to be the best worldview for us. So I want to open up with my bias. Here's my bias. My bias is I believe that God has revealed himself in several ways. He's revealed to us through 
himself to us through the Bible. He's revealed himself through the lives of men and women throughout time, most notably in the man Jesus of Nazareth. And I also believe that God has revealed himself to us through nature. And that brings me to something called the two books philosophy. Uh, church fathers like Justin Martyr, all the way through the Revelation, Reformation to modern times, many people have believed that God reveals himself to us using the Bible and what we call the book of nature. So you have the book, the book, uh, the holy book, the Bible, you got this book, and you've got the book of nature, the universe around us, the world around us, how God reveals himself to us. So the question is, has God revealed himself through nature? And in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, we get this. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. I love also Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. I believe God has revealed himself through nature. So as we compare scripture with science, what do we think about when we think about scripture? Scripture is eternal truth. Scripture is wisdom that allows us to live godly lives. Scripture is a historical account of the Hebrew people, of the man Jesus, who is our Lord and Messiah, and early Christians who followed Christ. The scripture is how to have a relationship with God, with Christ, and with others. That's what the scripture is for. The scripture is not a scientific textbook. What is science? Science is the pursuit of understanding the world around us. Science is knowledge-based and it's theory-based and it's iterative, it's a process. It's driven by a process of continuous searching. And the goal of science is how to understand the mechanics of the world and the universe around us. It's not about, it's not relational. It can be relational. I mean, you can do science with other people, but it's not primarily relational. We don't do science so we can have a better relationship with someone. Well, maybe you do in your lab group if you sit next to a cute girl <laughs> in high school lab group or college lab group. Maybe you can view science as relational there. But other, other than that, it's mostly how to understand the mechanics of the world and universe around us. And I want to give some encouragement here at the end that there have been many famous Christian scientists throughout time who have viewed this similarly to the way I'm describing it right now that there is a book of God, that there is scripture that is important and is, is authoritative and all the things that we think the Bible should be, but also believed in science and in the process of science. And here's a list of just a couple, and I know I've heavily weighted it with physicists because I'm a physics guy and I love physics, um, but look, we've got Galileo, we've got Kepler, Pascal, Newton, Isaac Newton, the inventor of calculus, one of the fathers of, of physics, was an Arian. He believed that Jesus was not God. How powerful is that? He actually thought, interestingly enough, and this is not a focal point for this class, but he actually thought that his writings on religion were more important than any of the work that he did in science. And the reason why you've never heard of any of those writings is because he wasn't a Trinitarian. Maxwell, Maxwell's equations, Gregor Mendel, uh, the geneticist, Lemaitre, We'll talk about Lemaitre later. He um, invented the term Big Bang. He was a Catholic priest who was also a, uh, an astronomer, and he coined the term Big Bang. Heisenberg of Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle. Werner von Braun, uh, the fam ro famous rocket scientist. Katherine Johnson uh, from the Hidden Figures movie recently. And then a more modern one, John Polkinghorne, British uh, mathematician physicist. So, we can believe in God and we can still trust science. We can still trust the methods. We can still believe that it's worthwhile, a worthwhile venture to do science. So I want to close with a question. What is our assumption about the Bible? And I love this quote from Galileo. 
says the Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Mm. And I, I will quibble a little bit here with the exact verbiage that he, use, he uses here. But I think the point remains the same, that the Bible is here to teach us about God, about the Lord Jesus, about how to be in a relationship with one another, about how to live a godly life. It is not a, a scientific textbook. So should we expect the Bible to speak accurately according to a modern view of science? I think the answer has to be no. Moses would not have had the vocabulary of dark matter and quarks and protons and neutrons. We shouldn't expect the Bible to speak accurately according to a modern view of science. But should we expect the Bible to communicate eternal truth in a way that could be comprehended by an ancient culture half the world away. Yes, the Bible is gonna communicate eternal truth. We're gonna see that throughout this class. And we're gonna see that there is still wisdom that we can pull from these same scriptures that apply to us today. And that's the exciting adventure that we're on here in the scripture and science class. Thank you.